Yo, what's up beautiful people of YouTube? Welcome to Dom's Media Zone. Today's video is one tutorial that covers Canon Digital Photo Professional 4 from beginning till end. So I've made one tutorial, it is a lengthy tutorial, so what I will do, I will split it up into chapters. You can go ahead in the description. If you know most of it, you can skip to the parts that interest you only. So this tutorial is intended for somebody that's either never used Canon DPP4 or is very new to it and is struggling with most of the functions. Somebody that's more on the intermediate advanced level can also find some useful tips in this tutorial. You might want to just skip to the parts that interest you. By the end of this tutorial, you should have the necessary knowledge to navigate through Canon's DPP-4, to use all the different tabs in the tools palette and to have a good understanding of what all the functions do and how they affect your photography. Now over the past year I've made plenty of other videos regarding Canon's Digital Photo Professional 4 with lots of useful features and functions and how to use them. I will put links to those in the description below this video. So if you haven't already do go check those out. Without further ado, let's jump into it and I hope you enjoy. Alright, welcome to today's tutorial on Canon's DPP-4. I'm going to go quite quickly because we've got a lot to cover in this tutorial and we're going to start off with the basics which is the interface of Canon DPP-4. So I'm going to show you around just to familiarize yourself with all these buttons here at the bottom on the sides here just so you know how the interface works. If you already know this part feel free to skip to the next chapter and let's begin on the left hand side over here you'll see a panel with the name folder on it and this is your computer's file structure structure over here. So on the left hand side all your computer's files are over here. Now you can see one that's called this PC. If I expand this it'll give you basically all your hard drives or so your C drive and if you've got additional drives it will list them here. So depending on where you store your photos when you first download them from the camera you most likely put them on one of your hard drives and then put them into some kind of folder you'll be able to find your folders over here. So mine are usually on my D drive under the photos folder and over here I've got my raw file so I'm going to be working with the raw files today and let's select the Canon 90D raw files folder so if I expand this you can see all my folders that I've taken recently uh, in my on my Canon 90D so I'm just going to select this one Dom London trip November so this is just some photos I took in November last year and it's good enough to show you guys how this works so over here you can see that my thumbnails of the photos are displayed I've got this one selected right now now I've got this one and this one you can click on them to select the different photos now down here you can actually change the view so this is just to show you the thumbnails but if you want to see the preview as well down here go ahead and click on this middle button to switch the view to a multi layout horizontal ribbon so you can see all your thumbnails down here are arranged horizontally now and your main picture the one that's selected is showing in this little display window. So what you can do here is you can make the thumbnails a little bit smaller if you wish using this little plus and minus smaller or bigger and depending on the size of your thumbnails this will either increase or decrease so I like to keep them a bit small so I can just skip to the next photo and get a good preview of the next photo and the next and the next. Now from here it is quite easy to sort your photos out when you first put them on your computer especially if they raw files sometimes uh, you need a special program to sort through raw files so this Canon DPP4 works really well for this. Now say for example I wanted to delete this photo all I would do is make sure it's selected down here click delete on my keyboard and as you can see the photo has disappeared. Now keep in mind once you delete the photo down here or from this preview window it is gone from your folder so deleting the photo does remove it from your folder and it will send it right to your recycling bin so if you made a mistake you can go to the recycling bin and get your photo back. Okay if I do increase the thumbnail size you'll see you can make your thumbnails bigger but then your main preview window gets much smaller. That's one thing to note and then over here the third button you can switch also to multi layout and it's a vertical thumbnail so you can go downwards here and scroll down and go through all your photos this way you can even use the cursor key on your keyboard to go down to the next picture next picture next picture next picture and so on so you can easily go down through all your photos and sort them out that way down here you've also got options to rate your photos so you can for example if you're trying to see what's your best photo say I think this is my favorite one from all of them I can give my photo five stars I can give this photo let's say two stars and let's say this one I don't like I can give it one star and it's a good way to kind of rate your photos from best to worst and when you're done sorting you can 
for example, delete all the one star photos that you don't think you're going to keep. It's up to you however you want to use this rating system. Then over here, it's also got something from one to five. So instead of stars, you can just give it a rating out of five. Down here, there's a little button that can rotate the image for you instantly or rotate it the other way around if you want to. Over here, you've got buttons that can move to the next photo, next photo, next photo. Or if you click the one on the very far right, it goes to the last photo, the one on the very far left goes to the first image and so on. So over here, these are quite useful and they're used for filtering your photos. Now over here, you've got something called the tool palette. So we are gonna go into detail with the tool palette when we use the edit image tab. It's the same palette that comes up, but if you quickly wanted to adjust something on your photo, you can click the tool palette and for example, adjust the brightness of the photo instantly. As you can see, I'm just going to undo that and close the tool palette. We'll go into details about that a little bit later then over here you've got a histogram so if you click this button you can see a histogram pops up of your photo and the histogram basically shows you on the left hand side all the dark parts of your image so how much dark parts or really black parts of your image are here so I, I can see there's not so much the middle part shows you the gray areas or the mid tone so as you can see it's there's a little bit of them here which is probably this tower and then on this side you can see the highlights so that would be the sky and all the very bright parts in my photo as you can see there's more highlights than dark parts but it's not overexposed because this peaking thing doesn't go right through the line so then you know it's not overexposed and not really underexposed neither to get rid of it just click this button again and then over here you've got something called the navigator now if i click on the navigator it just shows me some information about this photo tells me the file name what camera it was taken with some information like the iso the aperture priority the focal length and so on all the specifics of this photo are here now to get rid of that click that again this button is enabled because this is when you plug in your camera to your computer and use it for remote shooting so there's a button here called remote shooting now i've got a whole video about remote shooting i will put some useful videos in the description of this video so go check those out if you want to learn more in detail about canon dpp4 all right also down here you'll see a button called raw and jpeg images now i'm only looking at raw images right now but if you had a folder where they are mixed you can click this button to group the raw images together and the jpeg images together now over here you've got select also, if I wanted to select them all and say delete all of them in this folder for whatever reason, I could use this button and then press delete to get rid of them. Or I can deselect all and that means none of them are selected so no image is showing. If I select one, it's back on here and shows once again. So this is a really useful way to preview your photos. And I'm just going to jump back into this thumbnail view over here. So I've got my thumbnail view again. And as you can see, the ratings we gave our photos. So this one, we gave five star, that's still here. Two stars here, one star, that's still here. Those ratings stay. All right, now in this view where we're viewing the thumbnails, let's just increase the size of them a little bit. Say, for example, we want to see our thumbnails that are this size. Now, if I click on this button here, this you'll see now will give me some additional information about each photo so you can see here this photo was taken at f11 1 over 30th of a second iso 100 so you've got the settings that this photo was taken with right here when you click this button if i select the normal one you can see it gives me just the minimal information which is pretty much just the thumbnail. This one gives you a little bit more information. This one over here gives you the thumbnail with info. So it's really good to, to see the info sometimes. So each photo will now have its own histogram and all the information that came from the camera. It tells you the pixel size or the size of the photo. It gives you the lens that was used. All the information that you need about that photo is here, including the histograms. I can straight away see this one's overexposed. As you can see here, the highlights are peaking on the right hand side. That's really useful. Then you've got the select all and deselect all button once again. To make my thumbnail smaller again, I'm just going to minimize them. As, as you can see now, I can see them a lot smaller with all the info displayed. So now I'm just going to jump back into my thumbnail view. And another way to view your photos is by a list. So there's the fourth button here, and this is a thumbnail list. So this basically gives you just a list of all your photos. Also gives you the camera, the image size, aperture value, shutter speed, ISO, and so on. Now, the nice thing about this list is you can always add additional information here or take away information. So, for example,
example, there's a little button here called change the properties displayed. If I click on this button, it brings up the preferences window. Now on the preferences window over here, you can see that it matches what's on these columns. So you've got your file name, your shooting date, which is here, your camera model, which is here, your image size, and so on. Now, if I wanted to add things to this list, I could say I want to add the lens information. I can say add, and now you can see what lens I use to take these photos. So I want to add my rating, which we've done earlier for a few of them. You can now see your rating appear here as well. Click OK to just close that, and now you've got additional information about each file, and you can now filter the files based on what your criteria is. So to use filters over here, you'll see something called filter and go ahead and click on and that will activate your filters on your Canon DPP. So to use filters, I recommend jumping into the show thumbnail view and then we can switch on our filters. Now, sometimes you might not see them, so you might have to just kind of open this filter down over here on the right hand side. There's like an expand and collapse button which brings them up and closes them. So you might not see them. You might have to click this button here. Now, this allows us to create different filters. So say, for example, I want to filter by the rate things we've done and I only want to see my five star photos and there we go we've rated this photo five star so now it shows us that photo say I wanted to filter by um, let's say focal length for example so these are the different focal lengths of the photos that are here say I only want to see the photos that I've taken at 50 millimeter focal length and there we go I can instantly see my three photos that I've taken at that focal length so it's really good you can filter it down further by different things and create multi layers of filters likewise you can switch your filters off if you don't want to see them anymore and then you can collapse this if it's in your way and then over here you've got a sort by so you can sort your photos by for example ISO speed and then this will sort the photos out depending on what speed you took it so the good way to see it is to go back into your list and then if we find our ISO speed you can see it sorts it from the lowest so ISO 100 all the way to the highest which I took was ISO 6400 so this is a way to sort your photos I mean you can do it by date if you've got a big collection of photos on different dates and um, image size you can sort them however you like all right another useful feature when looking through your photos is this quick check button over here so say for example say you found a photo you might be interested in you go ahead you click on it and you press the quick check tab now what that does is it opens up a preview window where you can see the photo that you're looking at and over here on the right hand side gives you all the information once again it gives you a histogram and it gives you all the info about the photo and then it also gives you the rating system so you can add uh, whatever ratings you want to apply to these photos say you want to give it a four out of five and three stars or four stars what you can do here then thumbnail position i think this just moves the way it's displayed so you can have your thumbnail at the bottom or on the left hand side but the real nice feature over here is you can go into full screen mode by pressing this button over here so if i go ahead and click full screen mode it now displays the photo correctly on the screen so i can actually see what's going on in it now if i hit a escape it will come out of this photo back to the screen also over here you've got options to zoom in so you've got a zoom in like that you can do a times one zoom in and then you can just use this cursor to kind of move around the photo or you can go back to your normal fit to screen over here and here you've got different percentages that you can zoom in by so say we zoom in by 200 and once again you zoomed in on your photo you can see the details much better now and this button to revert back now to come out of this quick check you can press over here to return to the main window and there we go now we're back in our main window so i'm going to just carry on using these i i kind of tend to prefer this one and i usually make my icons a little bit bigger so i can see each photo like that but it's up to you how you use this all right the next nice thing to show you is say for example on this folder structure of your computer say you keep coming back because you store all your photos in a specific folder like i store mine in the photos folder what you could do is right click on it and then you can select the bookmarks option and now it's bookmarked this folder what that means now is that every time you close dpp4 you're not going to have to come back and look for your folder you can go ahead there's a little bookmarks tab over here hidden at the back if you click bookmarks you can see all your photos are bookmarked now so all my folders that i store my photos in have been bookmarked for easy access now you can add numerous folders i wanted to add this london trip to there i can bookmark that as well and now you can see i've got photos uh, do i want to save it no no to 
all i don't want to save anything and then i can now easily access this folder from my bookmarks over here to take it out from your bookmarks just right click on it and remove from your bookmarks so i'm just going to remove all these from the bookmarks and then over here you've got another cool thing which is called collections now collections what it does is it lets you set up a bunch of kind of categories you can call it that depending what you want and you can save different photos into different categories so say as an example if i say add collection and if i want to do best photos so say i name my collection best photos and it's got a little value in here which is zero right now that's the amount of photos that are saved to this category it's basically like creating a tag to a photo that saves it in a specific category so say i think this is one of my best photos i can right click on it and then i can over here say add to collections and now it displays the name of the collection I've just set up. If you had multiple collections, it would give you multiple options. So I'm just going to save it to best photos. And you can see now there's one in my collections. So for easy access, the next time I launch Canon DPP4, I can just click on this best photos. And then by doing that, it will display the photos in that collection only. So I can work on my best photos if I wanted to save time and only use those photos for an example. Right. And in a nutshell, that's how you use your interface. So I'm just going to jump back to my main photos here and what we're going to do now is we're going to just select one of these images and we're going to jump onto the edit image tab which opens up our tool palette which i've talked about briefly earlier and we're going to go into detail on that all right so if i scroll down to see a good photo that we can use as an example let's just select maybe this one it's got lots of colors in it and it could be used so once i've selected my photo that's the one i want to work with or to improve then i can go ahead and click edit image so if I click edit image you'll notice it opens up the photo now the whole preview of the photo and it gives us the tool palette on the right hand side I'm going to go through each and every tab on this tool palette to show you how it works um, before we do that let me just show you these options at the bottom over here so as you already know these options here are to zoom in so you can choose to zoom in by a certain percentage and over here as well you can zoom in using the plus and minus to return to the original size of the image you click over here here and this will fit the image to the screen down here you've got a few interesting options so this one over here it shows only the edited images what that means is that while we're working and editing things that's the image we displayed if you click this option down here this drop down you can say show only original image for example and that will change back to the unedited image likewise over here this can be used to compare the before and after photos so this option will give you the before and after and this option you can pin and compare images horizontal or vertical however you like it to be so if i do vertical it goes this way right so normally i work on this option over here show only edited image and then when i'm nearing the end of my editing process i compare the photo by looking at the before and after likewise over here you've got something where you can display grid lines and if you click on here you can actually choose the amount of grid lines you want to see so i'm just going to leave it like that for now so let's switch off the grid lines and then over here you've got the show only or to focus points so if i click on this you'll see a little red square shows up on my image now this is the point that my camera was focusing on when i took the photo so depending on what your focusing mode was when taking the photo that's the points that will be displayed now you can have show all autofocus points and then you'll notice it's got these little black squares in here you can hardly see them because this photo is quite dark right now maybe if i boost the brightness all the way up there you go there's some black spots over here so those are all the autofocus points but the main one that was focused on was this part right here now if i just undo that the next thing i want to see you can activate and deactivate this by clicking on it and the next thing i want to see is show highlights and shadow warning so if you click on this option it will actually give you a warning so all the highlighted parts where it's too bright they'll be in red so as you can see all these lamps here were considered a little bit overexposed they'll be highlighted in red and all the really dark parts that are underexposed will be highlighted in blue so we can make this even more blue by dropping the brightness so i dropped the brightness of the photo and as you can see now a lot of the parts are really blue so that means it's very underexposed likewise if i do the thing the other way around you'll see much more red spots on here so it's a good way to tell what's underexposed and what's overexposed so you can switch that off again 
And by clicking this drop down option over here, you can actually select the color you want to use for the shadow warnings or for the highlight warnings. So you can change the different colors and customize it a little bit. And then over here, you've got something that says show properties on preview images. So if I click on this, you'll just see it will give me the information about the photo, the lens and ISO and so on, the file name and the time it was taken. So it gives you all that information by clicking this button here. All right, we're going to start with the basic adjustment tab. So this is where you perform all the basic image adjustments to your photo. I normally prefer to start with this lens correction tab because once you do a lens correction, it can alter the colors a little bit. Usually I prefer this part first, but for the purpose of this tutorial, we'll just start with the first tab and that's the basic adjustments tab. All right, so as you may have already noticed, the first option is the brightness adjustment. Now this lets you add some brightness to an underexposed photo or take away some brightness to an overexposed photo. So by moving the slider to the left, you'll make your image darker. To the right, you'll make it brighter. So in our case, this image looks a little bit dark. So I want to increase the brightness by quite a bit because it was an underexposed image. I could potentially move it something like that's a bit too much. And if you're not sure, you can always click this option here. As you can see, all these bright spots are highlighting red, which means it might be a little bit too much. It's still a little bit too much, but because the image was quite dark, I'm just going to leave it like that and not worry about the bright parts right now. We can always adjust them later on. Over here, you've got an option called the white balance adjustment and you'll see a little dropper tool. So this dropper tool, it actually lets you pick a point in your photo and Canon's DPP will adjust it for you automatically. So how it works is you should find a spot in your photo. Once you click on this, find a spot that's kind of gray. So if you find something in your photo that's grayish, you can just go ahead and click on that and it will automatically adjust the white balance for you. In this case, it did a really good job. Sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it does, depending on the photo that you took. But for the purpose of this exercise, I'm just going to undo this part. So I'm just going to click undo here, but that is always an option. Down here, you can also choose in what conditions you were taking the photo. So say, for example, we think it was a cloudy day. I can click on cloudy. And as you can see, it adjusts the photo for me automatically based on those conditions. If I click daylight, as an example, it adjusts it to daylight. Currently, the default option was shade because it assumes I took the photo in the shade. So I'm just going to leave it at that for now. Over here, we've got an option called fine tune. Now what this does, it lets you fine tune the colors in the photo. So for example, if you look at this photo, you can see that it's very yellowy and orangey and it's got a lot of warm colors in it. If we wanted to adjust that a little bit, just to tone them down a bit, you'll see this palette over here. It's got different shades and different colors on it. And there's currently a little cursor in the middle, which you can't really see. But if you hold your left mouse button, you can drag it around. If you decide that this photo has too much yellow or orange, find the yellow or orange color on your palette. As you can see, it's on the right hand side here. What I'll do in this case is move the cursor away from this color, meaning I'm taking away some of that color. But by moving it this way towards the left, I'm actually adding a little bit of a different color. In this case, it looks like it's the purpley blue color. So if I grab this and move it slightly to the left, you'll see all my really orangey yellow colors are toned down quite a bit. And this look I kind of like, and it's not that orange as it was before. Now by moving this, these automatically adjust. The B stands for blue. This stands for amber. This is magenta and green. So we took away some of the amber and gave it more of a blue tone. And this we're just going to leave alone. But you could take away some of the green if you wanted to by moving this to the left. You'll see the photo changes tone and color. So I'm just going to undo that one and leave it like that. All right, over here, you've got something called the auto lighting optimizer. I usually just leave this selected and leave it as standard. So this is basically you telling the DPP for software, how much do you want the software to auto optimize the lighting for you? So I don't want it to be a strong automatic function or a low function. I just leave it as standard. If you scroll down over here, you'll see something called the picture style. Here is where you can help the software to see what type of photo you've taken. So was it a landscape? Was it a portrait? If you don't want to decide, just leave it as standard or you could use automatic. Let's click on auto. You'll see it will most likely not change because it automatically decided for you that the standard profile was the one to use. But if we think this was a landscape, we can choose landscape and then you'll see it adjusts the photo automatically towards more of a landscape photo. If you wanted fine detail, for example, you can click fine detail and so on. Now this one doesn't look too bad. The fine detail looks all right. But for the purpose of this exercise, I'm going to leave it at standard. 
Up next, you've got the gamma adjustment and you've got an option to let the software automatically adjust your gamma for you. So let's give that a try. If you click on it, you'll see that it goes in progress and tells you to wait a little bit and it adjusts it for you how it thinks the gamma would look best in your photo. Now it did a good job in our case, so I'm quite happy with that, but this was just for this exercise. I am going to undo this and we'll try to do all this manually. So by clicking auto gamma adjustment, it adjusted all these things down here for you automatically. So I'm just going to undo all that and we'll do these manually just to show you how they work. All right, over here, you've got a little histogram that you can adjust things manually. So in a histogram, as I've mentioned, on the left-hand side, you've got your dark tones or the black colors. In the middle, you've got your gray tones or the mid-tones. And then on the right-hand side, you've got your highlights or the bright tones. And then you'll see some lines down here. So what you can do is you can move these lines left and right. So if I move this line to the right, you'll see I'm actually increasing the black tones. So you'll see everything got a little bit darker. Darker, so I don't want to do that. I usually just leave it where it's just about to meet this graph over here. So you can see in this photo, there's a lot of mid-tones. As you can see, the peak is focused more towards the middle. So this line here would control the mid-tones. And then by moving it to the left, you'll see I can brighten them up. By moving it to the right, I can darken them up. So I'm just going to maybe brighten them up slightly. So I'm just going to move it from this default line a little bit to the left. Do we want to move it a little bit more. Maybe not something like that. Just a small amount makes a big difference. And then over here, you've got the highlights line. So by moving this to the left, you'll see the highlights now get really bright. Moving it to the right, the highlights get more dull. So what we could do in this case, I think we had a little bit of highlights. So if we click on this again, you'll now see the bulbs are highlighted. If I move this a bit to the right, our highlights decrease and get a lot less. Now, I don't want to take them all away because I think they have a cool effect in this photo. So I'm just going to kind of leave this and switch this off to see how it looks. I'm just going to kind of leave the highlights somewhere there. It looks all right. Now, moving on to this advanced section, you'll see we've got contrast, shadows, highlights, color tone, color saturation, and then the sharpness tab over here. For the purpose of this exercise, I'm just going to take the sharpness away and we'll adjust the sharpness a little bit later. Now, the contrast is that thing that you can add this little contrasting between the black and light colors. So by increasing the contrast, you'll see the highlights and the blacks stand out a little bit more. I usually do increase the contrast slightly for my photos and leave it but not too much you can do it a lot but see what happens if you move the contrast all the way up it becomes like very light against black but if you take it all away and move it to the left you'll see that kind of goes away which looks all right in this case so it's up to you and your eye what you think your photo looks best at so in my case i might actually decrease the contrast in this case just to let the colors stand out a bit more instead of the highlights and the dark tones because we've got a lot of mid tones in this photo as you could see here on the graph now over here, you've got a slider that's the shadow slider. So this controls the amount of shadows. So if you find that you've got a lot of dark shadows, you can always move the slider to the right and you'll see it brightens up your whole image. If you wanted the shadows to appear a bit darker, you could move the slider to the left and then it makes all the shadows much darker. So in our case, I do want to brighten the shadows up a little bit. So I might leave it at plus two. Now the highlights works exactly like the shadow slider, but with the highlights. So with all the parts that are really bright, like the sky here and all these lights we can control what happens so if i move this all the way to the right you'll notice they get a lot brighter and you'll see this thing is spinning so it sometimes takes a while to load the effect before you can see it and there we go once it's loaded you can see now the highlights are much more highlighted you can even see that by clicking on this button here the highlights are really bright so that was just to show you if i drop the highlights the other way they are much more dull and not as bright so i'm just going to leave the highlights at something like maybe minus two and that looks all right kind of balanced out now the color tone you can actually change the tone of your photo by moving this to the left you're giving it a more amber tint and by moving it all the way to the right you're giving it a more green tint so this is really good if you've got a photo that's for example got too much red or too much green you can adjust the tone of your photo by moving this left and right if you have a portrait where someone's face came out really red you could counter effect that by moving it to the right or just giving your photo a tint however you feel it looks the best 
And then the color saturation over here, this is the strength of all the colors. So by moving this all the way to the left, you'll see the strength of the colors fades away. By moving this all the way to the right, all the colors become really punchy and bright. And in this case, it's oversaturated. So I'm going to go back to the middle. And do I want to increase this by one or not? Since this photo does have a lot of colors, I might just leave it as it was on neutral because otherwise it becomes too saturated. Now the sharpness is a really useful tool to get some more clarity out of your photo so well there's two options if you click this drop down there's one called sharpness and unsharp mask now sharpness is the one if you just quickly want to adjust the sharpness and the best way to see the sharpness is to actually zoom in on something in your photo so let's zoom in quite a bit let's say 400 let's leave it on this sign over here as you notice we've got our sharpness turned to zero right now let's move it all the way up just to show you what happens it makes it a lot sharper but you'll also notice it introduces a lot more noise so when you make something extra sharp you've got to deal with the noise afterwards so this sharpness option on its own it's good if you just want to adjust the sharpness and you're in a hurry and you're editing lots of photos so you just want to increase it a little bit you could use that but the option i prefer to use is this unsharp mask here as this gives you a couple of extra options when dealing with sharpness so the first one here the strength that's pretty much the same thing the sharpness did so let's move this to five for example as you can see it made the writing much more visible much more sharp but it also brought in all this noise now the fineness over here that works with the sharpness that increases it even more and kind of makes it even more sharper so we could do this like say five and three for example but then you'll notice all this additional noise around the sharpness so what you want to do is use this thing called threshold and what that does it leaves the sharpness of the things that you made sharp but it counteracts it with smoothing it down a bit and taking away some of that noise let's increase the threshold to five for example as you can see our things are still sharp sharp and focused but there's not so much noise now so this works as a kind of counter effect to the sharpness that you've done here so you just got to find a place where it kind of balances the both so maybe sharpness four would be good fineness maybe two and then the threshold we could leave at something like four and that looks like a balanced choice for me to see the before and after you can untick the sharpness so this was before and this is after and then to zoom in back to the picture you click on here and that sharpness has been applied to all the pixels throughout your photo and then down here you just got like a navigator window that shows you some information about the photo and then on top here i didn't mention but you do have the histogram so it shows you that there's a little bit of dark tones in this photo a lot of mid tones not too many highlights at all so the histogram looks all right now now we've done with the basic adjustments tab now the next tab we're going to look at is adjust the image detail now this tab is all about reducing the noise in your image so let me show you how that works over here you see the sub window and then you've got this little button over here where it lets you reposition the sub window image if I click on this button you'll see my mouse turns into a little cursor and then whatever the cursor is pointing at is displayed in the sub window so let's go ahead and a good example of noise is on this man's coat over here so if I click on the coat over here you'll see all these little noise you've got like color patterns you've got some kind of colorful noises on it and a lot of pixels over here so that's where we can reduce the noise over here on these three options down here now you've got two types of noises over here one is the luminance noise and the other one is the chrominance noise so i'll put a photo up here with the difference to both so basically your luminance noise is this kind of just pixelated black and white and gray kind of noise pixels and then your chrominance noise is to do with the pixels as well but the colorful pixels so in here we've got a good example of the chrominance noise and luminance noise so what we can do let's adjust this to what we think would be better and as you can see already if i move this to just seven it already removed some of that luminance noise which is just the gray noise but the color noise is still there because that's the chrominance noise so if i move this all the way up see what happens it kind of blurs it out so we might not want that all the way blurred out so i'm going to leave it at about eight i think eight's a good kind of look and it took away the noise next is the chrominance noise let's try up that a little bit until those colors get fixed so as you can see we still have some of it over there and now you can see the coat starting to look nice and even and then i'm just going 
going to bump this up a little bit maybe all the way till seven there we go that color is gone and you can see that it's still loading this might take some time to load because it's applying these settings to every single pixel in this image so give it some time to load and watch this man's code over here once it finishes loading you can see there's some kind of lines here that's the color noise and you'll see that being corrected there we go it's finished loading and you can see those lines are gone now and his coat looks one even color as it should now over here you've got something called the color more i think that's how you say it so what this is i'll put another picture up here in the left corner it's this kind of noise that's often formed by patterns in the photo so particularly with clothing if you've got clothing with different patterns on it it can cause this color more so what i like to do is just kind of make this on let's say the middle or two or three maybe two just in case you have any you might not even spot it straight away but in case you do have any this will remove it for you so that's the three main things in this tab that you want to adjust the sharpness tab we don't have to do again because it's the exact same sharpness that we've used in the basic image adjustment you'll find this sharpness tab in a couple of these tabs here it's all the same once you've done it you can just leave it all right up next we've got the adjust image tone curves tab now this is a tab where it shows you the histogram and it's got this line across it and it's called curves because you can move this line up and down or you can add extra points and create curves in your photo so i'm just going to undo so to undo everything just click up here and there we go so over here you can see that it's set to red green and blue and over here you can choose the red green and blue channel which adjusts all the colors at the same time if you make any change to this or you can adjust individual color channels so how this works is by moving this line down it basically makes your image darker by moving this line up it basically brightens your image up so that's how the curves work and the nice thing is you can put different points on here so as you can see on the left hand side is the dark colors in the middle is our midtones, and up here is our highlights which we don't have a lot of so say for example we wanted to work with a red channel say we wanted to take away some of the red from the midtone. so what I could do is put two points here and then using my left mouse button put another point and drag this down and technically that should take away a lot of the red color as you can see and make it darker I could also make the red color a little bit brighter if I wanted to and you see how the channels work but the easiest way to work with this I'm just going to undo all of this is to set this on red green and blue and then choose this luminance red green and blue what this will let you do now you can see you cannot control the individual channels but you can control the whole of it at the same time so you're controlling the light of this photo with this luminance red green and blue so once again if I move this up towards the left you'll see it gets brighter if I go and move this down you'll see it gets a little bit darker so you got to decide where you want this photo how you want your photo to look so in my case let's have a look my dark tones already kind of lightened up so I don't really need to change a lot here but I could put some points over here and maybe an anchor point and what I could do is I could make the dark parts a little bit darker if I wanted to there we go and the mid tones I could brighten up a little bit here we go and then the highlights are they too bright if you think they are too bright you could decrease them a little bit so that's kind of how it works and um, to be honest I don't use the curves too much maybe just to do a slight adjustment here and there they are useful if you want to use them per photo it's up to you also over here you've got the brightness and contrast so you can go ahead and add some more brightness or take away brightness by moving the slider left and right you just have to watch the photo and figure out what looks the best for this exercise I think I am going to undo everything we've done here and um, also just to point out you'll see this input output level this fills out automatically when you move these points around so as you can see we now took away all the highlights and made them really dull by moving this top part of the curve because that's where the highlights are on this section here if we wanted to do the same to the midtones you could do that and you'll see it gets a lot darker as well so I'm just going to undo all of that and we're going to leave our image as is for now but that's how the tone curve adjustment tab works over here you've got the auto lighting optimizer that you've seen on the basic image adjustment tab already I usually leave that at default all right, the next tab we're going to look at is adjust image colors. Now, this is a really cool tab. I like playing around in this tab. You can do some really wonderful stuff in here. This tab basically allows you to adjust each color's channel individually so you can make changes to each color in your photo without affecting the other colors so just to start from the top here you've got something called the hue and that's to change the kind of hue of the whole photo so if I move the hue to the left you'll see it gets more of like a kind of ready pink hue if I move 
it all the way to the left, it becomes pink. If I move it all the way to the right, it becomes green. So the hue, you can kind of just adjust the hue of your photo using that. I'm going to leave that at zero. Saturation is the amount of color you want in the photo. Now, the nice thing about this saturation here is if you bring it all the way down, it removes all the colors. So in the basic image adjustments, we've seen saturation, but it didn't remove all the colors. This one here removes all the colors so you can make your photo black and white. And then by increasing it all the way to 200, it will really pop your colors out, which isn't good for our photo right now neither. So I'm just going to undo that. Do we want to increase the colors a bit? Maybe we do. Let's just move it to 105 just slightly. There we go. You can't really see too much changes. So it's a subtle adjustment. We could move it a little bit higher if we wanted to, just to give the image a little bit of that more popping kind of color. There's a button here that says monochrome. If you click this button, it will make your image black and white. So if I click on it, it will lower all the saturation of all the channels to zero. So let's click on monochrome. You can see it took away all the color, all the saturation from each one of the channels. And if I click undo, it takes it away. All right, now to demonstrate how these individual channel works. So you've got three options here. One is the hue, one is the saturation, and one is the light. So basically for each channel, so this case red, let's have a look at the red. Let's adjust the saturation all the way to the top to see where our red colors are. And as you can see now, all the reds really popped out. So by adjusting this channel, we're affecting all those red parts in this photo. If I take away the red, for example, it will take away all the red color. If I leave it in the middle, it will just leave it there. Now, if I wanted to change the hue of the red, say I don't like the, the color red that's showing here, I could adjust the hue. So if I move it to the left, you'll see it will change the hue or the color of the red completely. So now it became more of a pink. So you can adjust all the red parts in your image, make them pink if you wanted to. If I move the hue the other way around, they become more orange. So it's still a color of red, but it's a different hue. For example, I leave it at minus four to give it a little bit of a pink tint and I can increase the saturation a little bit of the red and then the lighting part by moving it all the way to the left I'll make all the red colors really dark by moving it all the way to the right you can make your red colors really bright. So this controls the brightness and the darkness of that specific color channel. So in my case, let's make the reds a little bit darker, but not much, just minus one. That looks kind of all right. And I'm happy with that. Now up next, we've got the orange channel, same principles. So what you can do is if you think your photo is a little bit too orange, you can bring down the saturation of orange and you could maybe bring the light up a little bit to make the oranges a little bit brighter. And then the hue, we could make the orange a little bit more red, even if we wanted to by moving the hue down a bit. And I kind of like this effect. So now we can move on to the yellow. How much yellow do we have? We do have a bit of yellow in here. Let's increase the saturation of yellow a little bit. There we go. The yellows are popping out a little bit more. You can likewise change the hue, which I won't do. Should we make them a little bit brighter? Maybe. And green as well. The green is a good one to look out for, especially if you're doing photos in nature where there's a lot of green. It might be worth playing around with the hue. The hue can change the green quite nicely. Now, keep in mind that grass and plants have green and yellow in them. So both these channels will usually affect photos where you've got a lot of nature in them. So if I wanted to change the hue of the green a little bit, I could move this a little bit to the right hand side, which is usually what I do when I have photos of nature and I could brighten them up a little bit. Let's try brighten it up a little bit more, I'm trying to get this Christmas tree a little bit brighter. There we go. In my opinion, it's okay for now. I could increase the saturation a little bit of the green and so on. You get the point now. I'm not going to adjust all of them. Now it's good to point out that the color blue sometimes affects the things that have black in them as well, as well as the stuff that's got blue inside it. So say for example, we wanted to lighten the jeans and the trousers on this photo, we could increase the blue, for example. And as you can see, the colors got a bit brighter. We could actually take away blue completely and make the trousers gray if we wanted to. It's really nice to play with these individual channels because you can customize your photo exactly how you want it to be. Now, another Another nice thing to point out is that you could literally switch it to monochrome and switch off all the colors and then adjust just one color. So if you wanted a gray photo with just one color popping out, you could do that in this tab and it gives it this really cool, unique monochrome look with one color popping out. All right, up next, we've got a tab called the Configure Basic Image Settings. If I click on this, I hardly use this tab to be honest with you. This is where you can choose the color profile that you're working with. I just tend to leave 
leave it on srgb whatever the default is and this is where you choose the color profiles that you are working with all right the next tab we're going to look at is this perform image lens correction tab so i'm going to go ahead and click on this tab and you'll see the sub window once again which works the same kind of principle as we've used before so what you want to do is click on this button here and choose something i prefer to always choose something with writing on it if there is something like that kind of demonstrates the use of these quite well and now i've just hovered over this please mind the step sign over here i like to zoom in a bit so over here you can choose how closely you want to zoom in in the sub window so say i'm going to zoom in with the maximum amount which is one over four that gives us the zoom on this little tiny piece of writing here so you can see what it says uh, i might just move this down a little bit to find the right kind of let's use this one as an example so we've got something in our sub window that we can focus on to see the effects that take place now over here you'll see a little button that's like a little refresh button almost and it says lens data no so by clicking this the dpp software will connect to the internet and download the lens data for the lens that you've been using to take the photo so let's go ahead and try that out so if i click on this you'll see it opens up like a list of all the lenses that they supply for canon and here you can kind of filter them out by category but you'll most often find that the lens that you've been using for the photo is already highlighted so in my case i was using the efs 18 to 135 millimeter lens the usm version so it's spot on and what i want to do is make sure that's ticked over here and then click on start and what that will do it will import all the lens information from the internet and apply it to your settings over here now if i scroll a little bit down just so we can see all the settings by importing the lens data you can have the digital lens optimizer if you select this it will deselect these two options over here the diffraction correction and the chromatic aberration correction so that does it for you automatically and you can choose how much you want to adjust it by i'm just going to scroll up a bit so you can see if it actually fixes everything if i zoom in a little bit if i do a bit more here and you'll see it's loading so it does take some time to apply the settings you'll see the writing over here had like weird colors it had like a purpley tint and a green tint before now that's gone because it's applied this digital lens optimizer if i switch this off you'll see that color comes back so this color over here is the chromatic aberration it's kind of like a phenomenon where uh, your lens reflects a certain amount of light or something to that effect i can't really explain it scientifically but it basically leaves this kind of tint of color on certain things in your photo you can also achieve the correction of this without enabling this digital lens optimizer by choosing it down here so if i choose chromatic aberration over here you'll see it corrects this color thing on the writing over here yeah, it does take a little bit of a time to load so it's a little bit difficult to play around with so the preview kind of shows it instantly which is really good and then what you can do is choose the strength but be careful here because choosing it all the way till 200 doesn't necessarily fix it it just moves the color to the other side so it moved it from the top to the bottom because it's the opposite side of the spectrum now if we move it to zero you'll see the color moves back to the top so i find that it's really best to just leave it at 100 in the middle as the default was or better yet just leave this digital lens optimizer somewhere in the middle and that will correct everything for you including the diffraction correction now if i uncheck this the diffraction correction is really really difficult to explain it's got something to do with the aperture of the lenses letting in a certain amount of light which can cause some issues so i choose just to kind of leave them enabled but normally what i do instead of adjusting these myself i just leave this digital lens optimizer to on and i leave it somewhere halfway and then I know that when it's done it adjusts this automatically for me based on the lens data that we've imported so let this finish loading as you can see the men's coat and everything went back to how we had it before because it's loading once it's done loading you'll see the effects at the end and there you go it's finished loading up and it's applied the digital lens optimizer to correct everything the way it thinks best for our lens this color blur option over here i just usually leave this ticked this used to be an issue with some old lenses it's where two different colors has met it caused a little bit of blur in the line where they met but the new lenses i don't think have that problem anymore but i just leave this enabled 
doesn't hurt your photo in any way. Up next, you've got this peripheral illumination. What that means is certain lenses, especially like uh, wide angle lenses, they can either darken or lighten the corners of your photo, depending on the light outside that the photo was taken in. Just look at the corners when I enable this. So what that does is it adjusts and fixes the light around the corners for that specific lens. So in this case, it did make a really good difference. You can always switch it off and on to see the before and then the after. And in my case, I am going to leave it on. If you move this more to the right hand side, it will make it a little bit more lighter. If you move it to the left hand side, it will darken the corners for you. So you can use this to adjust just the corners. So I usually I'm going to leave it in this case at about 71 because the corners were a bit darker than the rest of the photo. Now over here, you've got an option called distortion. Now this is also mainly for the wide angle lenses, but it can be any lenses. So distortion is there's that slightly bent shape in your lenses and when you take a photo you might not even see it we've been looking at this photo and it looked all right but if i enable this if i click this have a look at the photo now as you can see it kind of stretched and moved so let me unable this again and then you see the difference before and then this is after so you can see everything kind of straightened out it adjusted the distortion of the lens over here you can actually choose how much of that distortion to what degree do you want the distortion to be corrected now lastly you've got sharpness over here as i've mentioned before sharpness is repeated on numerous tabs it's the exact same thing we've used previously now moving up we're going to do the next tab which is crop and rotate your image so i'm going to go ahead and click on that and give it some time to load this tab does take a while to load and you'll see the options become available once it's finished loading all right this tab allows you to cut away pieces from your photo that you don't want and resize your photo make it cropped to however you like so to begin using this click on the photo anywhere and you'll see this border appears it's this white border and because because I've got the show grid enabled, you can see a grid. I can always disable the grid by doing here. I can actually disable the border and the grid altogether, but then you won't really see what's happening. So I usually leave the show border on and the grid is useful when you're straightening your photo, which we'll do in a moment. Now, don't worry if you see that all the noise reduction and all these things we've applied before doesn't display here. This is done on purpose to speed up this process. Otherwise it would take too long to load. But when you skip to a different tab, all those options will come back all right so now you'll see the border we can actually go to these white spots and grab the border wherever we want and we can adjust our image we can move the border to where we want to crop so you can see now by adjusting the border this way all the parts outside of the border when we're done cropping so when you're done cropping you'll have to basically skip to a different tab to see the result when we're done cropping it will cut out all the pieces outside of the border we've got the border set to aspect ratio 3 over 2 which is what the photo was taken in but you can always change this around say you make it one over one that will make it a square so that means this side is one and this side is one so the two sides equal each other having a three over two means the top part is three lengths and this part is two so if I change this to, for example, 16 over 9, you'll see now the top part is 16. This part is 9. So it's like a ratio thing. So if I move this 7 over 5, you'll see now 7 and 5. Do we have one where the side is longer? So if I go, say, for example, take this one, 5 over 7. Now that's 5 and that's 7. So you can choose what you want over here. I'm just going to leave it as 3 over 2, which is what we took the photo in and adjust the size of it to fit our photo but before i do that let me just show you. you've got an option called free over here if i click on free this means we're not restricted by the ratio we can adjust the square to however we like it so maybe let's do that instead we can just adjust the photo to how we want it to be and let's say we exclude everything out the box and that looks good enough for me and maybe i'll move it a little bit this way so i want this to be in the center now we've got something called the angle this is really useful if you're out and about and you take a photo and you think it's showing a bit skew you can use this to adjust it so to do that i usually enable the grid and then i find some kind of like a straight horizontal line like in this case you can see this grass for example so if i move this to the left it rotates the image move it to the right it rotates it the other way around so what i normally do is just try adjust it until it's perfectly straight with that 
line. So in this case, maybe a little bit to the right. And I also tend to look at the people standing up in the photo, whether the lines are straight with them. And that's how I know my photos adjusted. And I think that's okay. It wasn't too off in this case here. Once you're done with that, all you have to do is click away to a different tab, like in this case, adjust specific area. So let's click away and you'll see the cropping has worked now, right? So in this adjust specific areas tab, once again, let your photo load before you'll be able to see the different options available. Now that it's loaded, you see everything is available to start working with. All right, so what this tab does, it lets you pick specific parts of your photo and adjust certain values such as brightness, contrast, hue, and saturation to only those specific portions of the photo that we have chosen. You've got a thing called set adjustment area. If I click on this and then I go back over my photo, you'll notice that my mouse pointer became this kind of crosshair with two circles around it. So the inner circle is the size of our brush or what we're going to be selecting. And the difference between the outer circle and the inner circle is our blur radius. So our blur radius, we can increase it, you'll see it gets bigger. We can decrease it, it gets smaller. So the blur radius is the area, say we were choosing this floor as an example. So the blur radius would be the area between the two circles and that will be the area where the effects are blended together to soften the transition between the selected area and the non-selected area. So if I increase my blur radius a little bit, increase my size a little bit, you can see now, let's make it a bit bigger. There we go. So we've got a blur radius. So if we were selecting this floor and we wanted to mix nicely with the grass on top, we can select the blur radius, the size of that meeting point with the grass and the floor. So to show you guys how this works, you've got five different selections that you can make in one photo. So we're currently on selection number one. And as you can see, if I click on somewhere and try select something, it selected it, but we can't see it. We can't see it because DPP4 doesn't highlight your selection in any way, which is kind of a bad thing in my opinion. It should highlight it in red or something so you know what you've selected. So the way around that would be to decrease your brightness all the way down. So then you can see now that part we selected got really dark. So at least we can see what we've selected. So I'm just going to use an example of this floor. Let's say we wanted to make this floor gray as an example. So what I'll do is I'll kind of just move around, move to the right. I'm holding my mouse button down while making the selection and just trying to keep my hand kind of steady while I select. You can see the blur radius left out that line on top. Now we can always drag the blur radius down a bit if it's leaving out too much and then go over it again. I'm not going to do a perfect job on here. This is just to show you how it works. So if I do that and then say, for example, by not holding it, by just clicking once, it also makes a selection. So if you've got something where you need to be kind of cautious around, I mean, I can select this lady's shoes. It won't affect it that much. Let's just carry on from this side and select the other side. There we go. And now I want to select the top part of the grass as well. All right, as an example, I mean, I missed out some parts here, but it doesn't have to be perfect for an example. There we go. And then here I missed out quite a lot. Now over here, what I can do, I can decrease my size of the brush a little bit just so I can select the areas around their trousers and their jeans. And you can always zoom in here, which helps a lot. So if I zoom in and I scroll down, you can see the selection still here. And it's much easier to select the parts that you were missing down here. And as you can see, the blur radius leaves out that area where it's applied. And let's just select this, select that, that. Now I'm going to decrease my brush size a little bit more so I can be more precise. I mean, this is just an example. I probably wouldn't use it in this way by changing the color of the floor, but you could do that. So that's one way of using it and just click, click. It's not really the greatest tool. I must be honest, it's sometimes a bit laggy. And if you select too much stuff, it will become a bit slow. But in this case, we've done the selection now. So we've selected some parts. We might have missed out a few here and there. And fine, let's just leave it like that. So now we've made our selection. You can see it's all dark. So what I want to do is bring my brightness back to where it was. So my brightness was zero. So I'm just going to say zero over here. And you can see the floor returns to its normal brightness, how we had it before. So we want to take away all the color of this floor as an example, just to make it gray. So what I'm going to do is go over to my saturation and drop it all the way down to zero. And as you can see, it changed it. So it took away all the color from the floor. It's no more like reddish browny color. It's now completely gone to gray because we removed the saturation. Likewise, 
otherwise you can increase the contrast and whatever I do now only affects our selection which is number one because that's the selection we made so hopefully you get the idea of how this works now if I wanted to adjust something completely different other than the floor I could choose selection number two for example it's always good to move the brightness all the way down just so you can see what you're selecting and then I'm going to increase my brush size you can take away the blur radius if you wanted to altogether I like to leave it slightly on there so let's say example we wanted to adjust the color of these four bulbs here so what I'll do is I'll just adjust my size and what I'll do now is I'll just select these bulbs over here just by clicking on them I don't have to drag so you click on them and as you can see it is a little bit like laggy it's not the fastest process and then adjust my size a bit we don't have to be precise in here it's just an example and we're going to click on that one as well and there we go so now we've got our four bulbs selected so whatever I do now I can move the brightness back to what it was which was zero whatever we do now will affect these bulbs so say I want to change the hue or the color of them if I move this to the left you'll see it will become more pink so there we go the bulbs have now become more pink let me move it a little bit more there we go they're very pink now now I can even increase the saturation a little bit to make them much more pink and there we go we've changed the color of the bulbs completely just by selecting them only and everything else is unaffected so you could do that you could play around with the colors and leave it however you like and you can make up to five selections to undo your selections you can just click this undo all button and that would undo everything you've changed so also the brightness we could make the bulbs a little bit darker we choose how we want them to look using the selections all right now the last and final tab we're going to be looking at is this remove dust from images or apply a stamp so go ahead and select this tab and you'll see once again you need to wait for the photo to load before these options are available once your photo is loaded you've got a couple of different options here so this tab is good for removing marks it's really good when you're taking portraits of people and you want to remove some marks from their face or some pimples or some moles or something on the face or it's really good for removing those unwanted things in your photo if you've got a bird flying over the sky which you didn't want or something like that you can remove it using this function so how this works is you've got two options here repair light and repair dark now repair light is if you want to remove marks that are light against the dark background and repair dark is if you want to repair dark parts against the light background so let's say for example I mean we don't have much to repair in this photo but let's just try find something so the best way to use this is to zoom in on something so if I zoom in let's scroll down to these people let's have a look let's maybe zoom in at 300% and there we go so for example this lady's jacket over here let's say we wanted to remove this light tag here so we'd go repair light because we want to remove a light object and you've got a radius here so it also changes the size of your brush and you've got two options here brush or pencil I usually use brush because that kind of blends in everything that you're repairing if you use the pencil it's kind of like a hard fix which doesn't blend it in I'm going to use repair brush and then I'm going to select light because we want to take away the light and if I click on it you'll see it kind of takes it away sometimes you might need to click on it more than once it doesn't do such a great job the first time and let's for example make it a little bit smaller we can remove all these light dust specks on her jacket over here and we can zoom up we can remove all these marks and it does a pretty good job at removing them for us so as you can see it's removed all the dust from her jacket so that's to repair light and repair dark works exactly the same way but the opposite direction so let's use the zoom times one what's dark here that we can remove don't see many things oh let's try remove some of these spots on the wood here so I'd go repair dark and sometimes it's not that great but let's try so if I click on it maybe I need to make it a little bit bigger there we go to give it a more of a radius it kind of works sometimes sometimes it's not the greatest depends on what on marks on the face it tends to be really good but on certain other things it's not that great you can see it's kind of removing the lines of the wood which isn't ideal in our situation right here so we might not want to do that is there any kind of dust specks here oh there we go there's a dark mark against the light background and in this case it worked and removed it pretty well that's the difference between repair light and repair dark and then also over here you've got some called select the copy source so what that does it lets you copy from one part of the image and kind of drag your mouse and cover something up in the other part of the image I've got a whole dedicated video to this by the way I will put the links down in the description have a look at some of the videos that will explain it much better but in this example let's try and actually do something so there's a little bulb over here let's say I didn't want that bulb down there so I'm going to zoom in 
find that bulb down here so there we go let's say we wanted to remove this bulb from the picture altogether so what i would do is click on select copy source and you'll see my mouse becomes this little kind of cursor with a crosshair in a circle and what i want to do is i want to click on somewhere i want to copy from so let's say i want to copy from here and then what i'll do is i clicked once and it becomes a circle and then gently move it there we go so as you can see that kind of cleaned it up i can actually make my radius a little bit smaller to do this i can just kind of fix up where it didn't copy very well there we go it covered it up nicely now let's say i wanted to remove this dark smudge over here i could just click here then there we go and i moved the smudge but you can see sometimes it, it depends on this tool really it can be really good and really useful but sometimes it just takes a little bit of trial and error to get it looking good there we go that looks all right i want to remove this dark smudge over here can do that there we go so it, it, it's kind of good you can use it for a lot of useful things uh, removing objects from your photo especially it works really well when it comes to that and i mean depends how much patience you got you can remove whole things like the sign from the photo by just copying from the left and slightly carrying on and carrying on and carrying on and that's how this tab over here works so this is the repair light and dark and the clone tool which you can select from and clone to another side so this tool is also kind of useful if you just want to clone something or copy a part of an image so for example if i take the pencil option where it's kind of like a hard copy and then if i make my circle roughly the size of this bulb so in this case yeah that's about right if i click on select copy source now having that selected and click my cursor in the middle what i can do is move that bulb to other places as well if i wanted to so i need to select copy source again then and then i can move that bulb as well to here and you can select copy source again and move that bulb to here here and so on so in this way we can actually add things to the photo or take away things from the photo it's really up to you but you can get quite creative with this tool as well so that was the last tab now just to show you there is an option here if i go back to my basic adjustment image so right to the beginning and you'll see there's the option here to see the before and after so what i can do is click now before and after and you'll see both images will load side by side so this is what we started off with this is how our image looks at the end now i mean we weren't trying to make it look good this was just to demonstrate to you how and what you can do using canon's digital photo professional 4 and that's how the resulting photo looks now going back to my show only edited image the last thing i'm going to show you for today is the save option so say you're really happy with your image you can click on save and it will pop up this little save panel you can choose where you want to save your image to by your desktop or somewhere on your files on this pc and one important thing to point out here is this image quality somehow the default can be six or seven sometimes i usually increase that and leave it at a hundred percent so this is full image quality and i can name my file whatever i like i can choose the file type that i want to save it as you've got things like tiff and jpeg i usually just use jpeg and then you can save your image down here a lot of times i get the question where people ask me how do i save my edited raw file as a raw file well you can't because a raw file is just that it comes out of the camera as a raw file and you adjust all the image properties over here when you save it it won't be a raw file anymore so once it's edited it's no longer considered a raw file just something interesting to point out so this is where you would save it and once you hit save let's say we want to save it on the desktop and i'm going to hit save it already exists do i want to overwrite the file let's say yes fine overwrite the file and you'll see that now it starts this kind of saving process now once you've done all your photos you can save them all at once and just leave this and it will run and save each and every photo on its own and there we go once it's saved you hit exit all right if you wanted to save a lot of photos all at once you'd need to come out of this editing image area by clicking on this button on the top left hand side and you'll see now it's got a little mark next to the photo that you've edited so by looking at these thumbnails if they have a little mark like that it means the photos are already been edited and you've done some work on it so if you wanted to select multiple photos you could hold down your control key on your computer and just select multiple ones and then use the save function and that would save multiple photos you can also do another thing which is really kind of cool if you've applied a whole bunch of settings to a certain photo and you think these settings might be applied to a similar photo so like i don't really have a very similar photo here but let's say for example this one so what i could do is right click on this photo 
copy recipe and what that does is it copies all those settings that we've just applied and then we can right click on the photo we want to apply it to and say paste recipe and you'll see it automatically applies all those settings so it already brightened it it's done exactly the same settings we've done to this photo now this might not work in this case because this photo is completely different but it's a way to save you time so for example if you've got photos of a beach and the sea that are like you say you've got 20 photos you can copy the recipe from the one you've already fixed and apply it to the rest of them you can also save the recipe so you can save the recipe as a file somewhere on your computer on your desktop or any folder and then later on if you want to use it you can right click on it and then you can say read and paste recipe from the file and then that would allow you to open up the file with the recipe and apply the settings to the next photo without you having to go through that process again and that's what I've got for today for this tutorial it was a lengthy one so I do hope you enjoyed this and I hope it helped you out. Thank you for watching this tutorial. I know it was a long one, so hopefully you found a lot of useful information and you've learned something new. As usual, thank you for watching. If you did like this video, do give me a thumbs up and do consider subscribing to this channel. I'll try to make more videos in the future. Some of them are technology related, some of them are equipment related, media related, photography and so on. So I hope you find this channel useful. Do subscribe if you haven't already. And as always, thanks for watching. Stay safe, take care and goodbye. Thank you.